Now we have our guest here, Dr. Wisdom Enang, uh, who joins us virtually. Good morning, doctor, and welcome to the program. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Um, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. I can hear we'll you. Hear you now. We're, we're glad to have Thanks, you uh, on the program this morning. The pleasure. All right, so let's swing into it. We're looking at human trafficking. So uh, let, let, let's start off. Um, take us through. Give us a bit of, um, shall I say, history or a bit of knowledge on what is happening as regards to human trafficking today. Uh, thank you very much. Just like I was listening to you speak, uh, both of you, um, there, there are a number of ways that uh, the human trafficking uh, in the business does manifest. Mm -hmm. um, I, I said business, not that that is giving it legality, but that's just to show you that, yes, people are taking it like a, a real source of livelihood, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is purely very illegal. Now, there are a number of ways. There are some that have been trafficked uh, out there for prostitution, there are some that have been taken out there for organ donation. They have no clue what they're going to do. There are even some that are being taken out there uh, for some so sort of uh, modern day slavery. There, these are minors that are taken out there, and and maybe they don't really know their rights that yes. they're supposed to be in school. Uh, and um, you know, these people they think they're being done a favor, but at the end of the day, uh, these people are exploiting them. So, for, in the way you look at it, and, and the thing you have to understand about trafficking is that it's a very, very uh, complex network. It's an international network. Uh, and, and I say that with confidence because when you look at the cartel, for example, say a Nigerian cartel, mm -hmm. and the Nigerian cartel is saying to you, okay, I'm going to take you to Europe via the roads. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to a place like Libya, you're being handed over to a different cartel altogether. Mm -hmm. And... You know, those guys, they also factor in the aspect that, you know, you could die on the road. It's, it's, it's possible. It's a risk. Uh, and, um, you know, this, these are things that could happen. So by the time you're dealing with different cartels, sometimes they change the playbook on you. Sometimes those ladies get raped. The men, you know, get tortured or, you know, made to do very hard labor. So there's a number of things. And there's, no, there's nothing to tell you that these guys are going to uh, play by the books. There's nothing to tell you when you're dealing with a criminal, a criminal syndicate. So trafficking is quite a very complex um, net, network. And, and let me say, the people that I, I get even worried about are the people who ordinarily, the country they have been trafficked to, for example, is a country that they could have gone on their own, but they didn't know that. I'll give you context. Um, I, I met someone who was, uh, you know, kind of enslaved. For, for a couple of, you know, uh, I think years, the, he was supposed to pay back a certain amount mm. to the person that helped them, uh, you know, travel to Ghana. And I asked him, why did you need anyone to travel to Ghana? He said, because I didn't know anywhere and I've never been to Ghana. I said, but are you aware that all you need is uh, a passport, um, a Nigerian passport or an ECOWAS passport, and then you travel to Ghana? He said, mm. really? I said, yes. Even if you're going by a boat, or by a car, all you need is that. And he said, I didn't know that. And someone, because he didn't know that, someone promised, I'll take you to Ghana, where you're going to be working for me for a couple of years. Mm. Wow. And, that, and that's vulnerable these people are. And, and, and to, you know, the issue is this. I think we are so, uh, so much sentimental about the entire Jaguar syndrome. <laughs> That the moment we hear about Japan, we don't even know the country. We don't know if it's worse than Nigeria in terms of survival, in terms of economy. As long as it's outside Nigeria, we're ready to indulge. That is how, you know, the, 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 the basis that these people are capitalizing on the average Nigerian, uh, you know, who, who eventually gets uh, trafficked. You know, you just opened a, a, a can of worms. That's all you just did. Yes. And you know, you, you said something. It is, it's, it's a serious crime. It's, it's a serious human rights violation. Yeah. So let's talk about it here. What is the primary role of law enforcement agencies in combating uh, human uh, tra trafficking? Okay. I think primarily uh, the government agencies are meant to protect the people. They are meant to. So the way I would put it is, first... The government agencies are meant to educate these people of their rights. Mm. Because I find that a lot of them 
are either they are manipulated to end up being sympathetic to their, uh, you know, the people that are perpetrating these crimes against them, and they're not even aware. They're thinking this is a favor. You know, see some of them defend the, 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 the whoever is uh, taking them there. I think it's a favor. Education is very simple. It's very important, sorry, because you need to break that jinx. The second bit is, there's this, you know, we are over spiritual in this country. So when one, someone tells you uh, you're going to take an oath, they think this is uh, binding, this is, I must do this, I must do that. And that's why a lot of them are there. So there's a spiritual angle as well, mm -hmm. for which... The government needs to step in and say, look, no, you, you can't take this. These are, these are things that, you know, you, you really don't need to go through. This is a kind of life. And I think we're not sensitizing enough when it comes to education about how horrible it is to even live in the UK mm. as an illegal immigrant. People don't understand it. I've been lived in the UK for 12 years. And I can tell you, if you're I illegal, you you're, you're most likely not going to be taking advantage of the UK banking system. You'll be taking money, uh, you know, you know, cash, and you're most likely going to, you know, have have to work in a very, very insane conditions because your employer is employing you on an illegal basis, and they know that you don't really have a choice. So people don't understand this, and this is some of the things that the government needs to educate people on. That look, there are there, there are these risks associated with it. The second thing is. We need to actually be checking who is go traveling with who. I think we leave a lot of those checks for the visa, uh, you know, for the people that are granting the visas. But there are clever ways to do that. Now, if you are granting a visa, for example, I could easily put a, my visa with a couple of people and say I'm going for a church occasion, and you know, no one knows if I'm going, for, if I'm trafficking those people. Mm -hmm. But at the point of departure, I think we could do a lot with the immigration by making sure that we're, we're confirming. Okay, so when they eventually travel, what is the purpose? Are there any red flags? Is he traveling with a minor that is not related with and then doesn't have the approval to travel with? Those are things we don't do. I know this for certain because those red flags get picked up abroad at the point of uh, entry, but they don't get picked up at the point of departure. Ah. So at the point of entry, it's when people hear, oh, what's the purpose of coming to maybe the United States? Who do you know here? Who are you traveling with? Why are you traveling? Do you have an approval? And that is when we get to know that, oh, there's a probable case of trafficking. But why don't we pick it up? So we don't do our due diligence. Now, when it comes to the idea of punitive actions, we do next to nothing. Because when these people are trafficked, and eventually, you know, the, the, the quickest answer for the international guys where they go is to deport them when they're deported when the victims are deported there's no follow-up once you leave uh if you're in lagos once you leave uh that uh the airport area they probably give you some orientation and then resettle you in the person that is is the mastermind of this crime who has enslaved other people goes unpunished and the funny thing is that once you open that box you are going into a pandora box mm -hmm. and the pandora box is going to go into a point where there are very influential people behind the entire scheme. And so at some point, the thing dies of natural causes. If it was an investigation, no one is talking about it again. You know, this thing you so just this said, this thing you just said and uh, reminds me of what Olimide and I talked about uh, earlier on, about a lawmaker who is incarcerated in the UK right now uh, for organ transplant, organ traffic uh, removal. Mm -hmm. You remember Equerry Madu? harvesting yeah. organ harvesting yeah thank you producer now at the point of the departure this wasn't detected it was in the uk where this thing was going to happen that it, it, it was detected and investigated and a, a punitive measure was applied which is exactly what you're talking about right mm. yes mm. fantastic please go ahead all right so um you you, you mentioned a whole lot of things um, which i was even going to get to you mentioned immigration uh, you mentioned uh, how sometimes this thing is detected only when it's been there. So let's look at our own immigration, the immigration service in Nigeria. What mm -hmm. can immigration do to stop this even from leaving the country? And also, apart from the immigration service, we also have human rights. We have international human rights. We have SERAP. How can human rights organizations also come in you know, and try as, and make their own contributions? To, because you know, just the federal government alone, it might seem too uh, burdensome for them. 
Okay, let's. Uh, I, I, thank you very much for that question. Let's play out the Equinum Madu scenario. Mm. Uh, I avoided talking about it for the most part because it was a developing case, but now the sentences have been done. Mm. We know a lot, lot more. Now, let's play out that scenario. Uh, let's play the Equinum Madu argument and the guy's argument and see what happens. Mm. Uh, when you look at the argument, the, the argument you hear is that this guy was told, I think, yeah, the, because they wrote a letter actually to the um, the UK saying that this is uh, this guy is uh, you know going to be traveling on the basis of uh, I think it was um, uh, I think it was a medical basis anyway, yeah. but I'm not sure what they stated as a detail. But once they went there, uh, I think he found out that it was going to be organ organ transplant, yeah. which I heard at some point he did not um, he, he quite he did argue with it but he was trying to make his finding but at the end he shall went to the police that's what we know mm. but why did he go to the police i'm not particular about the the brief story mm. but this other part is where i'm particular he went to the police because he was assured of being protected he went to the police because he was assured of support those are the two critical things when you talk about people being willing to come and open up are they assured that they'll be protected from those that are trying to fight uh, you know, traffic them rather, are they sure that they'll be giving comfort? What happened? The police said to the guy, tell us everything. Our legal system will protect you. In addition to that, we would help you claim asylum and make sure that you settle comfortably, that, you know, this becomes an opportunity for you. I would ask both of you, which of those opportunities would you get in Nigeria? <laughs> That's the first incentive to make sure that people are willing to open up. Now, the human rights agencies are doing their best. They're putting lawsuits against, uh, you know, the government to make sure that they're doing their duties. But, you see, the thing is, the primary, the prime mover in such applications is the government. It's not really the human, uh, you know, the human right. The human rights are only like a catalyst. They don't start. They don't end the reaction. But they only speed up the reaction. Yeah. But the government needs to give a framework that shows that they are protecting and they are providing comfort to the victims. Because the last thing you want to do is to end up being a victim twice. Mm. That's the last thing you want to do. And for us to do that in this country, we need to show that the law is uh, you know, is very uniform and homogeneous across the poor and the rich. As long as there's a dichotomy and people will feel that, oh, if this case is versus the rich, I have no chance we will never get to that point. Mm. You know, it, it's, it, we could go on and on and on, and, yes, you know, yes. if, if, if we really, really want to get down to it. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we need to wrap this up. Uh, Wisdom, you have been very, very fantastic, as usual. Thank you so much for being a part of the show this morning. Thank you very much. I deeply appreciate it. Yes. Enjoy your morning. Yes, you too.